The 15th chapter of Luke is one parable. Uh, in your Bible, you may see it listed as three different parables. But the genius of Luke chapter 15 in getting the message across is that there's three parts to one parable, and I'll explain why that is. Like the unfathomable triune Godhead, Luke chapter 15 contains one parable consisting of three parts. You have 100 sheep, one is lost and found. You have 10 silver coins, one is lost and found. And then you have one son. You have two sons. One goes away and he is lost and then he's found. By what measure does God establish value? There's value in that sheep. There's value in that coin. There's value in that son. The woman in Luke chapter 15, it's the middle of that three-part parable. If you turn your, like to turn your Bibles there. The woman in Luke chapter 15 has a dowry. There's a picture of one on the front of your bulletin. It is 10 silver pieces. The value of her coins was beyond measure. That silver is a depiction of an individual soul created by God and purchased with the blood of his son. To the elitist, human life is worthless. with the exception of, of their own lives, of course. But their tyranny is temporary. I'll read the verse, I'm going to read the first two verses of Luke chapter 15, and then verse, verses 8 through 10. Then all the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to him to hear him, and the Pharisees and scribes complained, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. Then down to verse 8, Or what woman having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she has found it, she calls her friends and neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which I lost. Likewise, I say to you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. In the Bible, you find this ongoing story of a holy God seeking to find and to redeem fallen man. Saving sinners is God's predetermined plan from eternity past. And many of us see Luke chapter 19, 10 as the key verse to this gospel. The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. So God sends a perfect man to seek and to save the lost, imperfect individuals. But while Luke reports that our Savior seeks the lost to save them, 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8 informs us that the devil seeks people also. He seeks whom he may devour. A crowd had gathered in the first verse of Luke chapter 15. Some came to hear and some came to hinder. In every case, every single one of them needed Jesus. But only a few of those people understood that need. Luke 15 shows three aspects of God's attitude toward man. The account of the sheep reveals God's love. The arrival of the Son in the last part of this three-part parable relates God's long-suffering. Then the assessment of the silver that we're considering today represents God's loss. Those silver coins illustrate the value of the human soul and how valuable it is to the Lord Jesus who was sit, sent down from heaven and how serious it would be if it was never found. Jesus had said in Mark 8, 36, what will it profit a man 
if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul, the loss of a soul. So the story of lost silver is signifying a lost soul. One of the most striking features of our Lord's teaching here on earth was how he placed value on fallen man. In those days, the worth of human life had sunk to the lowest depths. Cruelty had desensitized that society in those days to the point that human life meant absolutely nothing. A party crowd could be easily amused with the bloodshed and violent deaths of dozens at the local Coliseum. As lawlessness progresses among progressive people in our country, the value of a human life is greatly diminished. Now that's not the mindset of our God for His people. He values every one of you. God loves the lost sheep. He looks for the lost soul and He longs for the lost son. This three-part parable was, was heard by the scribes and the Pharisees as they murmured when Jesus received what they would consider worthless sinners, and he ate with them. So we have in this story the dignity of the human soul symbolized by one small coin. The special lesson before us reveals two aspects of our searching Savior. First, the, the love God has for that lost soul. You see, for a wealthy Roman, that coin that she lost was of very little value. Yet it was of extreme value to the lady of this humble home, and it was her dowry. Married women would wear a dowry of ten coins around their head, much like a woman today would wear a wedding ring. To a rich man, it was nothing. To a poor man, it was everything. So like a brand new coin fresh off the mint, the human soul has stamped upon it the image of its creator. The newly minted coin represents the soul's original dignity. Because of our fallen nature, it doesn't stay that way. Now, I have some old coins that my father gave me when I was just a kid. He was a caterer. He worked in a catering route for several years, and he kept a changer on his belt. And, uh, and of course, Detroit being the cosmopolitan, cosmopolitan place that it is, cosmopolitan, uh, people were from all over the world. And so Dad had collected coins from other co countries, uh, and uh, old coins from this country. And uh, I haven't looked at those coins in a while. I need to get them out and look at them. Some of them are so worn that the value is not nearly what it would have been if they were still in mint condition. As defaced as a man may be on account of the ravages of sin, never forget man was originally made in the image of God. It's in Genesis chapter 1 when God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So even in his fallen condition, worn away by sin, man is still in some measure made in the likeness of God. And even if you are the worst of all sinners, God sees tremendous value in you. And we see that in this silver coin so highly valued by the one seeking to find it. God loves that lost soul. Not only the love of God has, but the longing he has to save that lost soul. He says, what woman having 10 pieces of silver? And of course, if you're not familiar with the custom that I just told you about, you probably wouldn't understand why it was so valuable to her. She wore it as a headdress. All those 10 coins were linked together by 
one cord that bound them. Just as, as I said before, as you ladies would wear a wedding band. Poor young women would scrape and save for the most important symbol that they would know in their married life. To show little care for even one of those coins would show that she was, it was equal to her being unfaithful to her husband. So no wonder this poor woman was troubled and searched tirelessly <clears throat> for, for her precious coin. Man was created for fellowship. And a picture of this fellowship with God was meant to be depicted by the covenant of holy matrimony. The American government has lost all respect for marriage because it has lost its reverence for God. So we have the symbol of great value seen in that one little coin, but it was lost. So the silver coin was signifying a lost soul. Then we see here the searching for that lost silver. Great concern and confusion most likely developed when that dear woman realized that she had lost one of her most valuable possessions. To her, nothing could have been more tragic. It was, it was not so much what people would say, but her concern was how her husband would feel. Here's a small picture of the pain in God's heart over a lost world, and particularly over one lost soul. It's evidenced by the joy and the rejoicing that takes place in heaven over one sinner that repents. And it's important to notice, first of all, where the coin was lost. In the first part of this parable, where the sheep strayed away from the foal, it was lost in a dangerous wilderness. But here we have a more serious state of affair. The coin was lost, not out there on the lost in the wilderness, but right in the home. And this is serious. This depicts the possibility of a soul being lost within the circle of the Christian home, or perhaps right in the church. Many, is, many of us has, have seen this tragedy unfold in too, too many cases over the years. I, I could give you examples, but I choose not to. We recognize that people are lost without God, without Christ, but, but without hope in the world, as the Bible would say. But it's hard to grasp how one could be exposed to the gospel Sunday after Sunday. Now they can sit under Bible preaching and still be hopelessly lost. Too many times it's even in the preacher's home. Just being, being exposed to the gospel does not save you. Salvation can only be known by the presence and the power of the indwelling Christ. Jesus made it clear in Matthew 7, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. And you need to know what the will of the Father in heaven is. How are you going to do the, the will of the Father if you don't know what it is? Well, let me tell you what it is. It is His will that no one perish. It's always His will for the lost to receive His Son. Not only where the, law, the coin was lost, but when the coin was lost, somehow the coin became disconnected from the cord that binds this illustration is that of the fall. The story of the fall in Genesis chapter 3. The union existing between God and man ceased when sin came into the world. Sin cuts man off from God. In Psalm 51, 5, David said, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin. My mother conceived me. Every child that's born is born in sin. And it will remain lost until the Holy Spirit does a personal work in that life. And that's not going to happen unless the lost soul is exposed to the preaching of the gospel. We know when the coin was lost and we know where it was lost. But why was this coin lost? 
See, while the sheep strayed away through its own foolishness, the son left home because of rebellion, but, but the coin was lost by reason of an unconscious subjection to the law of gravity. It was so heavy that it fell. Being round, it rolled under something. It was lifeless, so it just laid there. Before a person is born again and knows the contracting and counteracting power of the indwelling spirit, he is an inevitable victim of the gravity force of sin. There's no hope for anyone that does not know the indwelling Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit, lost without God. The unsaved soul falls deeper into sin and farther from even ever being found. They would just roll away into the darkness and the defeat of sin. This depicts the tragedy of a lost soul. If you are lost, you were created in His image, but you have become defaced like some of those old worn coins that I have. And the devil may have tricked you into believing that you're worthless. He may have you graveling in the dust and in the dirt of sin, but nothing could be more tragic than to be lost right in a Christian home. There's a reason for rejoicing when a lost soul is found. And then there's the saving of that lost sinner. The oneness of this parable shows the activity of a triune God. In the story of the lost sheep, we have the seeking Savior. In the story of the lost son, we have the seeking Sovereign. While the story of the lost silver, we have the seeking Spirit. All three parts of this one parable illustrate that no person in the in the Trinity, acts independently of the other. The emphasis here is on the Holy Spirit's ministry in, in recovering that lost soul. God has a spiritual procedure for the recovery of lost men and women. And here's how it works. She lit a candle, a lamp, <clears throat> which very much illustrates the light of instruction. I think all of us went to school. Some went further in school than others. But you were instructed in something, in some particular, maybe some particular trade or profession. In this case, there's a candle that's lit. One of the inescapable facts of divine revelation is that the Holy Spirit, our teacher, never works apart from the Word of God. The Word of God that we submit to and the Holy Spirit that teaches us. As we open our Bibles, we read in the beginning, Genesis 1, And the Spirit of God moved, and God said, Let there be light. So you see the Spirit of God and the Word of God working together. From the beginning, the Spirit and the Word, word work together, and that still is the principle today. The principle operation can be traced throughout the entire Bible. Only the Spirit of God can light the candle of truth. Outside of that, you remain in darkness. You just can't see it. We know from the Psalms that the entrance of truth gives light. The Bible is a closed book to that man living in the darkness of sin. Only the Spirit of God can illuminate the page. John 16, 13, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. Jesus told a religious teacher, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And that word see is noteworthy here. Spiritual sight is a must. And even physical sight does not work. You may have 20-20 vision, but 
if you're in total darkness, you can't see. So there must be the light of instruction, but along with this, there must be the work of conviction. Sweep the house. This is the second function of the Holy Spirit in relation to a lost soul. Jesus taught this expressly when he said in John 16, 8, when he, speaking of the Holy Spirit, has come, he will convict the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. Where there is no conviction of sin, there is no conversion to God. Period. I've had people repeat prayers, and you probably have too. And then you tell them they're saved. And uh, it all sounds good, but I don't know if that's always the case. People, if the, if the Holy Spirit is not convicting that person, they're just saying words. It's not, a, it's not a genie's lamp. The real problem is not the guilty conscience. We're not talking about that. That's only a symptom of the real issue at hand. The problem is unbelief and rejection of Jesus Christ. So, so we have seen that the, whole, that the Spirit of God employs the light of instruction and then there's the work of conviction. I remember I was 10 years old when the Holy Spirit was convicting me deeply. And it was after church. Dad and I and Harold Presley actually were, were getting in the car to leave and true to, uh, to, to my dad's character, we were always the last ones to leave. As long as there was one person left to talk to, dad stayed. We got in the car and I began to weep. It was a Wednesday night. Dad said, what's the problem? I said, I need to be saved. And then there was rejoicing. When we got home, called Brother Morgan. He was in Birmingham, Alabama. He was my childhood pastor up until that age. <clears throat> there was rejoicing. This is the witness of true conversion when there's rejoicing. Oh, that doesn't mean you have to jump and shout and run, run all about, but it does mean that there is, there is a, there's a joy that's unspeakable and full of glory. There's nothing like the joy of knowing that your soul is saved and your sins are all forgiven. David describes this in Psalm 31, 32, verse 1, Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. The first two fruit of the Spirit mentioned in Galatians 5, 22 is love and joy. Then again in Romans 14, 17, the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. This joy is not only a human experience, it is also a heavenly one. The Savior went on to say in verse 10, Likewise I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repents. There was rejoicing in heaven when the lost sheep was found and when the lost silver was found. The mental image of a shepherd rejoicing after finding one of his sheep gives us some idea of how the Holy Spirit rejoices when the lost soul is saved. I wonder if you have a burden for a lost friend or family member. One who knows that life is short and eternity is long, but still doesn't know the Lord. They may know about him in their head, but they know nothing of him in their heart. You can identify with the hurt Paul spoke in regard to his lost kinsman when he said in Romans 10, 1, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. They knew him in their head, but they didn't know him in their heart. Good people, religious folks, but lost. God is anxious to save a precious soul. You and I play a part in this ministry, and when people come to a saving knowledge of Christ, we rejoice with the angels in heaven. 
and with our triune God. And that happens when a lost soul is saved. And we pray that that lost soul that hears this message is deeply convicted by the Holy Spirit. And we'll turn to Jesus and say, I am a sinner and I'm sorry and I want to be saved. And I know the only way I can be saved is by just putting my faith and trust in the one who died for me and I receive him into my heart. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for our time together in your word. Thank you for this triune parable that speaks such truth about being found once you discover that you're lost. And for that lost person right now, I pray that he or she would bow their head and say, Lord, I'm, I'm a sinner and I'm, I'm lost. I want to be found. I want to be saved right now. I don't want to wait another day. I want to be saved now. I don't want to wait till some church tells me that I have to do something. I want to be saved right now. And that person, according to your word, can be saved right now if they would just simply turn to you and trust you as their Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.